Okay, what we've got today is to give you an understanding, a basic understanding of landlord-tenant law. And it really is basic after all. So let me see if I can move you through some of this. So what do you know? Let's give you a little quiz to start here. Tenants who breach, true false incidentally, tenants who breach rental agreements lose rights under the MRLTA. False. Any other ideas? <laughs> Partly true, and we'll get to that a little bit. So, Once uh, proper notice is provided, a landlord may limit access to the premises by n a non-paying tenant until rent is fully paid. In other words, keep a tenant out if they don't pay the rent. Oh. Yeah. A landlord may, change, may charge a non-refundable cleaning fee in addition to a security deposit. A landlord may require a tenant to have carpeting professionally cleaned as a condition for returning the security deposit. False. False. Good. Tell us that All right. Uh, when a landlord accepts a tenant's rent, any breach by the tenant is considered waived by law. False. Good. Contents of a lease are irrelevant since the MRLTA governs all relationships between landlords and tenants. False. Good. All right. So. Well. You don't even need this stuff. So, and there's a standard disclaimer in there that I would give to landlords and tenants if they were listening to the live. So, uh, here's what we will not cover. We aren't going to talk about commercial tenancies. You may get questions occasionally for students that say, and in addition to my house, they rented me the garage for another $25. Well, that's... You know, it may be a kind of a storage facility uh, that isn't covered by the MRLTA. We can talk about that in more detail. Uh, we won't cover discrimination issues. In case I'm not around, when you have such a, and somebody comes in and says, you know, it seems to me that the other people that lived up here and they are of a different race got better treatment or worse treatment or something like that. We're not going to cover that. If you have questions about that, probably the best resource uh, is the Montana um, uh, Fair Housing that's in Butte. Uh, their number is readily available on uh, the web and uh, Pam Bean runs that program and knows that stuff backwards and forwards. It's too complex for what we'll do here. So what we'll cover today is residential landlord and tenant law and it is purely residential stuff uh, in Montana only. I'll give you maybe one federal case but no other state law and nothing in federal housing law specifically so and nothing in federal court except the one case. So, let's talk a little bit about the purpose of the MRLTA. What's it for? It's an understanding that the parties and a recognition that the parties need each other. Okay? You can't have landlords without tenants. You can't have tenants without landlords. That's just so obvious. And it seems to me some parties, both landlords and tenants, um, seem to ignore that. Incidentally, my folks were landlords, and sometimes uh, landlords accuse me of being biased in favor of tenants. I don't think so. I helped my parents pro manage their property for years, and I'm appalled at some of the things Montana landlords do to their tenants. So, And it's that injustice that keeps me doing this stuff. So it, the uh, MRLTA establishes the contractual and legal relationship between the parties, Every th it, I, sometimes you'll see some of these rental agreements come across your desk and they seem to be getting longer with smaller type that has everything in it but the kitchen sink and even more. You don't need that. Most of the stuff is covered by the MRLTA and why would you quote a statute in a rental agreement? Sometimes it just doesn't make sense to me but because the MRLTA covers it. It avoids the physical controversies hopefully between the parties when I was negotiating on on the bill itself back in 1974, I suspect, maybe even earlier. We were in Billings one time, and after a long session, maybe four hours long, uh, getting nowhere at the end of a long table, 18, 20 people there. I was, by that time, I think, uh, one of only two tenants' representatives left on the uh, panel. Uh, and one of the landlords got up, and she slammed her face, fist on the table and said, the only way to handle a landlord-tenant situation is at the other end of a shotgun. And then she walked out. Uh, it's that what we want to avoid, you know, and, and uh, we got a lot done after she left, actually. So, um, and for the most part, it works. And it applies to reasonable people. I also train the JP judges on landlord-tenant law, uh, and they asked me, you know, well, why, do, why does it always say uh, reasonably this and reasonably that? Well, it's because you don't make laws based on run unreasonableness, except criminal law. 
We do that. We say there are some things you simply cannot do you know, because it's unreasonable, essentially. It's against the law. But most of the stuff on the MRLTA is simply dealt with by being reasonable. So that's why it applies to reasonable people. The JPs are quick to remind me it's the unreasonable people that end up in court most of the time, and that seems to be true, unfortunately. So what kind of law is it? Okay, um, you're in your third year. Yeah, you kind of have some idea what where laws are. Is it property law? Did you have any landlord tenant stuff in property law? Mm -hmm. What one day, maybe? No, we did leases, evictions. Oh, you did. Um, okay. Warranties. Okay. Interestingly enough, the word eviction does not appear in the MRLTA. So um, we'll cover that in a minute. But is it property law? Did they teach you anything about enfeoffment with livery of season? No, huh? That's the kind, of course, our, our laws come from the common law of England. Uh, and the way they transferred property back in uh, the Middle Ages when common law started to become uh, more popular, I guess you could call it, uh, is by uh, enfeoffment. And usually it meant that I would take my firstborns, if I was the landowner, I would take my firstborn son, sorry ladies, women couldn't inherit, I would walk the meets and the bounds to the end of the property, I'd put my arm around my 12-year-old son at that point, and I'd say, say, son, someday this will all be yours. And he looks at me and he thinks, oh yeah, dad, who cares, I'm 12 years old, you know. Well, that's the enfeoffment part. Then the livery of season is I pick a clot of dirt up and I throw it in his face. And then when he's 21 and he comes out here and he goes, oh yeah, this is where dad threw the dirt in my face. That's, and, and, the, and all property was transferred that way, including rental property. Thank goodness we don't do that anymore. So it's really not property law either. Is it contract law? Can I put anything I want in a contract between a landlord and a tenant? What do you think? No. no. So we have abolished, at least in the MRLTA, um, the, uh, the, the uh, right to contract about anything, the freedom of contract, if you want to call it that. We don't do that because there are limits to what you can contract for and against. So it's not really contract law. I like to think of it most as consumer law, and it really seems to fit there best. You'll find there are a few places in the MRLTA where it says if there is a defect, the person affected that, that knows of the defect has to give the person, the other party, the opportunity to correct the defect first before any rights ensue. So that would be like, uh, like the lemon law for a car. If my car goes bad and I just bought it and it isn't working properly, I can't just say, Hit, take it back. I might be able to do that eventually, but my first requirement under most lemon laws is to take it back to the dealer and say, this doesn't work make it work, fix it, okay? First opportunity to correct the defect. And there are plenty of things similar to that in the MRLTA. So I like to think of it as consumer law. So sources of Montana law. We're going to talk mostly about 7024, 101 and following up to 422. That is the MRLTA. It was based on the URLTA when it was first introduced at the legislature, and it was introduced, and now we meet every two years at the legislature here, it was introduced seven times before it got amended to death. The, uh, it passed in 77. In 75, it was amended some 300 and some odd times before the legislature basically said, ah, we give up, we don't want to do that. At the same time, however, um, well, anyway, so, and, and I was on one of those committees, uh, not as a legislator, as a lobbyist for Montana Legal Services representing low-income folks at that time, uh, and was one of three, maybe four tenants representatives when we started. By the time we finished, I was the only tenants representative together uh, there, and the last, um, uh, actually, I'm the last surviving member of all of the people that worked on that. Senator Bishop in Billings is still around, uh, but um, uh, he's well into his 90s and doesn't spend a whole lot of time on landlord-tenant law. If you read that, cover to cover, essentially, you know, it doesn't have a cover, you would get about 80% of the law you need to know uh, for landlord-tenant experience to, to know what you need to know. All right, so it's a good part to uh, read. Um, 
Yes. Then there is Section 7025-101 and following. That's the Security Deposit Act. It's called the Montana Residential Tenants Security Deposit Act. Notice it's called the Tenants Security Deposit Act, not the Security Deposit Act. It's a Tenants Security Deposit Act. Landlords sometimes lose the, the sight of the fact that it is a tenant's security deposit. This section was actually part of the MRLTA in 1977, um, in 75 rather, when it was when the MRLTA was introduced, um, and um, it was carved out when it looked like the uh, the MRLTA was not going to pass that particular year. So it's actually. Uh, you know, its its birth mother, so to speak, is the MRLTA, but it is now, uh, it is a separate section. You'll find many other states pass them all together. And there you would get another, what do I have there, 5%, can't read the red. Uh, then there is 7033-101 and following. Probably about, I'm thinking it's about a mid-90s, early 90s, uh, there was some talk about uh, rental agreements that involve mobile homes that were different than regular housing, apartments and houses and so on. And so 7033-101 and following was anything that pertained that to a mobile home rental of the lot, of the lot. People own the motorhome but are just renting the lot. That's in Chapter 33 of Title 70. Uh, and so all of that stuff was carved out and it's basically a copy. There's a few exceptions. We'll see if we have time to cover those exceptions. If you read that, you'd get another 10%, and so far we've got 95% of what you'd need to know about landlord-tenant law. I want to uh, have you look at, and I think uh, Jordan printed out the code sections um, that, did you, Jordan? Uh, the excerpts of the law. You know, I only have one of those. Do you uh, okay, never mind. I'll just tell you about it. 7027-101 and following are the remnants of the old Montana landlord-tenant law, and it talks about unlawful detainer, or what we used to call back in the old days, prior to 1977, uh, summary eviction, where I could post a notice of termination on uh, someone's door and, and terminate a rental agreement. You can't do that anymore this that way. Uh, but I get these things, or used to when I was at Montana Legal Services, used to get unlawful detainer cases all over the state all of the time. And 7027-101 and following says quite clearly this portion of the act, or this portion of the law, doesn't apply to anything covered by Chapter 24. So what's covered by tw Chapter 24? All landlord-tenant relationships that deal with residential tenancy. So when a lawyer files an unlawful detainer action in Fairfield, is not going to cut mustard. You can't do that unless it applies to commercial tenancies, for example. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Montana Supreme Court cases. In your excerpts uh, thing that you'll have electronically, I think I sent that electronically to you, you'll see a list of all of the Montana Supreme Court cases that I consider to be important for uh, any understanding of Montana landlord tenant law. There are a lot more, but only those prior to 77 that I think have some relevance and only those that have uh, some significance for you after 77 on that list. But amazingly enough, I think it's only 33 cases. You know, really, that's not bad. You could go to the law school library and spend uh, maybe a day uh, reading all of those cases, and you would know more about that than most judges do. So it's an important f factor to have all those cases. Uh, and there you'd have, uh, but, you know, the reality is, we're going to have this hour and a half or so to spend time on the MRLTA, but it isn't going to cover everything you'd need to know. In fact, there's so much information out there, you could write a book about it. So I did. Uh, and I'll pass it around. It's, we have a copy uh, in the office, and there's, it's in the library. It's in the law school library. It's in the Mansfield library here. It's all over the place, and I'll just... Uh, uh, this is an older edition. I'm just have to take a look at it. So if I'm not around, and you can't ask me, or Annie, or Jeff, take a look in the book. Chapter four, particularly, uh, has all of the examples I've gathered from judges and cases uh, over the past 40 years uh, in there. So in a question and answer and and sort of annotated form for all of the case uh, case uh, the sections of the code. So I think you'll find that helpful. So there it is. Yes. Can you really read 33 cases in a day? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Though, especially these. Some of them are kind of fun reading, and we're going to go through some of them. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So what, when and where does the MRLTA apply? Well, let's just confirm again that it applies to all relationships between residential landlords and tenants. You can't exempt yourself. And there was a, you know, it kind of comes in waves. It seems like every 10 years, uh, you get these, some people that'll say, now that's just between us, right? We'll just do it this way. And I'll, you know, you'll give me a security deposit, but I won't take that in writing. We don't need to do that, do we? Yeah, you do. And there are some things that you can't get out of. And even if you don't put it in writing, the MRLTA still applies. Uh, we find that probably about 60% uh, of the rental agreements in this uh, state are now in writing, but there's still, that leaves 40% of that are just uh, rental agreements month to month that don't have anything in writing, still applies. Okay, and even if you had something in writing and it said the MRLTA doesn't apply to our situation, it still does. There are some situations where it is uh, by law not applicable. If I have a rental, if you can call it that, of a hunting cabin, that's specifically exempt. Believe it or not, married student housing, uh, all of Elliott Village and so on is not covered by the MRLTA. Of course, the dorms aren't. Uh, and Pavarello here in Missoula isn't covered. Uh, um, nursing homes aren't covered, those kind of things, even though some people pay month to month and so on. Uh, but almost anything else, if it looks and smells like a landlord-tenant situation, it's going to be called and covered by the MRLTA. So what are the highlights of the MRLTA? Well, one thing that, again, landlords seem to lose sight of is the fact that um, all of the actions govern, that are in the MRLTA are governed by good faith. And um, to me, good faith, or the definition is good faith means honesty in fact in the conduct of the transaction incurred. Honesty in fact in the conduct of the transaction incurred. So what does that mean? <laughs> you know, you can say it a hundred times, it doesn't get any clarity. It's like sort of the definition of, you know, truth isn't truth kind of thing that's been going around lately. It, I'll give you a, a better example. Linda Landlord and Terry Tennant aren't getting along lately, uh, although Terry doesn't seem to know that, but Linda doesn't care for what he's doing, whatever it is. And so she goes up to him one day and says, Terry, uh, you've been here about a year and a half, and I think it's time for you to find a new place. So here's your 30-day notice. And she just tells him she wants him out in 30 days. Well, the deadline passes, and he's still there. Okay, He doesn't have, take any action toward moving out at all. And she's a little bit intimidated by his size and bulk, so she decides just to file an action for possession, that's the word of art in court, to get her property back for failure to uh, move out on time. They go to court and uh, uh, Linda explains to the judge her side of the case. Then the judge turns to uh, Terry and says, well, Terry, how come you're still in there? You, you, uh, you're still there, right? And he says, yeah, well, why is that? Well, he says, you didn't give me notice in writing. Okay, all right, a, a termination of a rental agreement should be in writing, says the code. But he had actual notice of it, so it's probably not good faith for him to go into court and claim that he didn't have notice. So that's not going to work. So uh, there are prohibited provisions in the Act, uh, things that cannot be included. Uh, for example, what if I put in there um, that if you decide to have goldfish, I can give you a 24-hour notice to get out? That's... I just have a, you know, a pet peeve against goldfish or aquariums or something. Can you do that? 24 hours notice to get out? No, you can't, no. So, and there are consequences for that. If you include improper provisions, such as what happened in, um, and uh, Jordan has printed out for you, a case that was in district court, not, not, uh, um, uh, the Supreme Court yet, it might get there, a case in which a, a tenant had fees for uh, Jordan, let me, I don't have the case in front of me here. Yeah, all right, thanks. Uh, like failing to mow the grass, letting a rent renter's uh, renter insurance policy lapse, so on, would be grounds for eviction 
the district court judge, Leslie Halligan, said under those circumstances, no, you can't do that. That's well beyond what's expected in the MRLTA. She found those to be uh, improper. And uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to the attorney that was representing the tenant in that case, but it's possible that if the tenant won, there could also be some of the consequences of improper con inclusion would include that it's unenforceable, the judge just simply says you can't enforce that, or that attorney's fees may apply. And that's what we talked a little bit yesterday about even we at um, ASUM Legal Services are entitled to get attorney's fees if we win. Uh, the classic case that went all the way to the Supreme Court is Summers versus Crestview. And I'll boil that case down for you very, very simply. Let's assume rent, for the sake of argument, was 1000 a month. Okay, so 12000 in a year. During the second month of this, again, very simply, second month, the tenant goes to the landlord and says, I want to move out. We want to break our lease early. Um, uh, what do we do to do that? And the landlord says, you can't. Uh, what do you mean? We just, we're, we're making a down payment on a real house to, that's ours. We want to move out. Well, I'm sorry, you can't do that. Well, of course you can. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're going to leave. So the landlord says, and if you do that, not only will you owe us for the remaining amount of the lease, we're going to send that over to a collection agency right away. And there's some other provisions in the code, in the, in the contract rather, in the lease that say not only can they send it over to the collection agency, but the collection agency can add its own fees to that. So suddenly they're responsible for $10,000, the remaining amount. The collection fee company adds a, another half of that, $15,000, and some other additional dollars amounts uh, all the way up to $20,000 for, a, a, for breaking, breaking a lease early. Okay, Supreme Court said, uh-uh, can't do that. You just can't do it. Summers stands for, the, for that proposition. There's more to it than that, and it's worth reading, but some things are just not includable in a... Um, in a lease, and that's a pretty good example. And that's why I think that probably uh, Judge Halligan was persuaded that the weird things in the Galbraith case, the district court case, uh, probably shouldn't have been there. Landlords and tenants, that's what's the nice thing, thing about the uh, MRLTA. There are both rights and responsibilities on both sides, okay? And they're pretty fair and make good sense. So the landlord has obligations to maintain the premises, so does the tenant. So, uh, some of the common provisions are such things as maintain the premises, you know, just common sense stuff. Um, so that if something goes bad, you got to fix it. Okay, so eventually the, the court decided that that was um, our warranty of habitability. Those are all conditions upon which we can agree most of the time. If the furnace goes bad, the landlord ought to fix it, you know, those kind of things. If, there, if something breaks, it has to be repaired. So. Uh, it's not weird, but um, it, they're just common sense things. So we don't get into situations like this. I hope you can, you probably can't see that very well. Just to give you an idea, this is a basement in East Missoula uh, where the, um, the tenants were residing, um, and this was where they normally had their wash. Just, just to give you a little background, here's a better close-up. Again, kind of a concrete, nothing particularly bad about this, just kind of dumpy, you know. So here, on the other hand, right in the middle, uh, between the washer and the dryer is a, um, looks like about a 40-gallon uh, Tupperware or rubber-made uh, container holding the water that had dripped on there overnight, 24 hours, okay? Uh, that's what happened when the tenant complained. You know, I got this dripping downstairs. Here, this will work. No repair, just dripping. Uh, and she put the, uh, the styrofoam cup there just to show you how much water had accumulated during that period of time. How about this one? Um, dear landlord, uh, when I first moved in, you said you were going to fix these fixtures in the hallway, uh, but they're still hanging there, and I'm a little concerned about putting in a light. There. Now you're satisfied? <laughs> You'd think at least the landlord could have chosen white duct tape. You know, <laughs> Red Green would be proud of that one, I think. So um, how about this one? I don't know if you can see this very well on that, but right there, there's about a three inch gap between the, the wall and the sink. The sink is actually standing up on pieces of pipe. No, there's nothing, nothing here. 
the pipe is what's holding up the sink. When the landlord, when I mentioned this to the landlord, the landlord said, well, what's the problem, Mr. City? Does her toothbrush roll off the back of the sink? You know, that's just kind of, you know, is that alone uninhabitable? No, but with the accumulation of other things in that um, uh, apartment, it just was kind of not nice. Let's call it that. Here's one. This is an East Missoula. That is a piece of fungus. Okay, these are washcloths here. But that and this is the amount of mold and fungus. Not this is black mold, but not the dangerous, uh, really serious kind. But this fungus grew over a long weekend, like a Labor Day weekend. It might have been Memorial Day. I can't remember which. Uh, while she was gone, this is what the sink underneath looked like. Yeah, really. Look at all that black stuff back there. And all of this was there when they moved in, including the, the, the bowed sink. I'm always sort of interested in seeing the ceiling white here, uh, which apparently was not used very often uh, by the landlord. There's a better close-up. Um, but there's a picture of that mold. That's just a big chunk of mold. <laughs> okay, so is the landlord required to fix that stuff? Well, of course. The landlord has an obligation to repair and maintain the premises. So, one of the classic examples is a case uh, from the Drummond area. Uh, it's a 1981 case, as I recall, um, and in that particular case, the landlord got a call from the tenant saying, you, you know, every time I touch the light switch in the bathroom, I get a shock, and the landlord's response was, hey, if you don't like it, you can leave. Well, the next time the landlord heard from the tenant, it wasn't really that tenant. It was the tenant's widow. The person died uh, from touching that light switch. And it went to the Supreme Court, and the landlord's uh, attorneys actually argued, hey, you're suing us as a tort. And there's a, um, a line, shall we call it, to make it simple, between tort and contract. If we have a contract, you can sue me for breach of contract. You can't sue me for tort. Uh, that was their legal defense. And the Supreme Court basically said, give me a break, somebody died here, and it wasn't the tenant's fault. Somebody should have taken care of this, and they didn't. And as a result, they sent it back to the jury to come up with the amount of damages. And we don't know what happened, uh, because the case settled after that, but I can imagine the landlord's um, attorneys or insurance company running with their checkbook to settle that one out. Corrigan versus Janney. And that one really set the tone for uh, a... Um, for the warranty of habitability in Montana. That, you, you can't do that, you know, essentially. Mathis versus Az Adams and Magruder, this is a case that came out of Missoula that were um, Montana Legal Services, and I represented uh, 10 tenants that lived in a little dumpy trailer court called the River Road Trailer Court, Doesn't isn't there anymore. But if you're on Russell and you try to go to Reserve, you go along River Road, and it was this little trailer court that I swear had never, ever, ever been repaired uh, since it would, had been built. Uh, the if you really want to read what some of the tenants in Montana have to put up with, read that statement by the judge um, uh, or the court just to give you an idea of what things they have to put up with. There were um, uh, they had a wash house, which, which had two or three, maybe six at one time, washers and dryers. When they got bad, they were just locked up. They were never repaired. When all of them failed, the landlord said, okay, tough luck, and he just boarded this thing up. It looked like an abandoned building in the middle of this trailer court. The uh, roadway, which I swear has never had never been e uh, either paved or graveled or anything, was so dirty and bumpy in the spring, <laughs> some of the holes were big enough to hide a Volkswagen in. It was just awful. And the tenants would constantly complain uh, about sewage bubbling up right next to the trailer all the time because the septic system failed so frequently. And the landlord knew about these kids conditions and, and simply told were, uh, do, they did nothing. In fact, when they were told um, that they were going to organize, or when the landlord was told the tenants were going to organize a tenants union, he had all of the tenants, uh, the manager go around to all of the tenants and have them sign a statement that the conditions of the premises met the code, which none of the tenants uh, would sign. And when they didn't sign, they had no rental agreement, they were going to then be evicted. Um, the uh, um, the place was a dump, and that's the best I can tell you. That case stands for the, oh, and the, the landlord's defense was, okay, so it wasn't the best 
place to have a rental uh, in the world. But the, they actually defend it on the grounds of you get what you pay for. Okay? And the Supreme Court said no. No, that's not right. They paid for residential living, not to store their trailers there, regardless of what a bargain it might or might not have been. You are paying to live there. And then the, the second defense by the landlord was, okay, uh, maybe, again, uh, if you're not going to buy that, how about this one? They never told us in writing of the landlord, of our breach of our rental agreement, of our duties to maintain. And the Supreme Court said, you had a resident manager there that actually participated in making the place uninhabitable by doing some of these bad acting things. Um, and so they implied notice regardless of whether written notice, which is required under the Act, was there or not. So that stands for the proposition that if you've got notice, you got notice. And that's pretty good for tenants. Bush versus Camera, another case out of Missoula. Imagine a, a, a place with two walls, uh, or, or two houses, and it's a little bit farther apart than this. Let's give it another half of a, a room far apart like this. So what is that? Maybe uh, 20 feet apart, two houses. The landlord owns both. Uh, the tenant is a student, comes to town late, trying to get a place to rent. She sees the landlord in this place doing some stuff and says, can I rent this? And she's, he says, eh, you know, I'm not really right, ready yet. I got some stuff to do, but I really need it. I need it now. And he says, all right, okay, I'll, that's, we can do this. But I got to tell you, there is one small problem with this rental. The sole source of domestic water is a garden hose running from house A to house B. But I'll tell you what, says the landlord, I'm going to give you a 10% discount. Our rent would have been, as an old case, so I'll use the old numbers, uh, rent would have been $200, but I'll give you that 10% discount, so your rent is only going to be 180 She thought it was a bargain at 200 so uh, she decides to rent this place. Six months go by, and the landlord sends her a notice that uh, we're going to increase the rent. I always do this after six months with tenants, uh, so your rent is going to be 225 but of course, I gave you that 10% discount for that defect, and that'll still apply. You can do the math on what she's paying then. So then along comes spring, and she's up, it's a nice spring day. She decides she's going to wash her hair in the sink, and she's got it all sudsed up, turns on the water. There's no water. Goes in the bathroom, tries the tub, shower. There's no water. Sink has no water. She finally looks outside, and the tenant in house B is washing his car using the garden hose. She's not going to have any water until he's done. What do you think she's entitled to when she finally decides to approach the landlord and say, you owe me what? Water. That's one, one thing, water. What else? If I were to go to court, since I would be without water during this interim, what, what, what would you demand of the landlord? I demand attorney's fees for having to go to court. That would be person. one. That would be good. What was the, well, let's, let's back up. One of the obligations of the landlord, under the landlord's obligations to maintain the premises, is that it must meet code. Anybody think that running a garden hose from house A to house B meets code? Yeah. So the Bush versus Cameron case stands, it went to the Supreme Court on slightly different issues, but it stands for the proposition that a landlord cannot rent a place that doesn't meet code. That's what the statute says, and so the landlord is entitled to no rent. So what's the tenant entitled to? All of the rent she paid for this place for the entire period of time she lived there, even though she thought it was a bargain. You can't just say again, oh, we have this secret agreement that the Landlord-Tenant Act doesn't apply. No, you can't do that. It stands for that proposition that he violated the code under those circumstances. Another good example is one that happened to me, oh, just shortly before I left uh, Montana Legal Services. A uh, tenant lives in Haver, and uh, the, they rent, uh, I think he was a teacher, uh, renting a uh, remodeled garage essentially. And the neighbors or the owners of the house, they're 
oh, maybe uh, 40 feet away. But he re they rent this garage. It's a little bit better than a one room because there's also a, it's like a studio, but it has a, a separate bathroom. And he and his wife were in there at one time. And, and then in the winter, the place is just getting colder and damper all the time. And then they come home one day from work and they see a whole bunch of like green mold growing around the edge of the bottom. And they think, oh, landlord's going to hold us responsible for that. So he goes down there and starts picking at it and using Clorox and things. And he's picking a little bit more. And suddenly, w one of the boards pops up and the flooring is nice flooring it's pergo flooring expensive stuff and it was laid properly right underneath that pergo is that spongy foam that they used to lay it on and he picks it that little aisle and pulls it up a little bit more it's laid right over dirt floor on the ground tamped but it's dirt how many of you think that's meets code even in Haver, that doesn't meet code, you know? You can't do that. And yet they'd been living there in a place that was not code uh, eligible. And so whatever they paid again, they were entitled to get back. That one didn't go to the Supremes. Oh, I don't have to draw. So now we've got the landlord's duties. What are the tenant's duties? Same thing, common sense requirements. Take care of the place, essentially. Keep it clean is what those requirements uh, say. You know, responsibility for your guests. If you aren't going to do it right, or if you do it right, you expect the guests you invite in there are going to do it right as well. And if they don't, you're going to be responsible for any damages that they do. Simple, non-controversial, uh, common sense requirements. And it, you're supposed to use the premises for which it's intended. In other words, a residence. So, when the tenant finally confesses to me that, oh yeah, okay, all right, I admit, Klaus, that I took my uh, Harley apart in the living room and washed the parts in the bathtub, that's not an intended use, and you can't do that. And the landlord has the right to terminate that tenancy under those circumstances. Tenant may not, and this is a fairly new section, uh, by new to me, you know, in the last 10 years. A tenant may not engage or not only allow a criminal production or manufacturer or operation of an unlawful clandestine laboratory. Someone can tell me what a lawful clandestine laboratory would be. Uh, but that's the way they write the code. I had nothing to do with that section. So gang-related activities, um, criminal production of manufactured dangerous drugs, all of those kind of things. Notice that it doesn't make these things illegal. It's just that the tenant can't do them, and that would justify terminating a tenancy. Okay? And of course, they're illegal elsewhere, but that's not the point of, of the section of the tenant's responsibility to maintain the premises. So we've got landlord's responsibilities and tenant's responsibilities, and they mirror each other to a certain extent. Landlord can make rules, but there are limitations on what the rules ought to be. Fairness is fundamental. Now, tenants ask me all the time, so uh, I just moved in, and I found out the tenant in apartment A pays uh, $70 less in rent than I do. That doesn't sound fair. Sure it does. They were in there longer. They started earlier. That has nothing to do with fundamental fairness. It's when I adopt a rule that unfairly applies to all tenants, that's where the fairness, the fundamental stuff starts to ap apply. And it, it has to have a reasonable relationship to its purpose. So let's assume uh, uh, Linda Landlord and uh, Tracy Tennant are having some problems. Uh, and uh, one of the problems that Tracy, uh, that Linda has with Tracy is that Tracy never parks her car in the right spot. Every time she comes out and she gets complaints from the other three tenants in this um, uh, quad uh, building, um, and um, uh, sometimes she's parked in apartment A or spot A, sometimes in spot D, and sometimes sort of in two or three at the same time. So. She goes to a landlord's meeting, and the uh, the tenant, the landlord association tells uh, Tracy or tells Linda, you know, you can make an ironclad rule. You can make sure that they follow those rules, and if they don't, you can terminate the tenancy. So she goes back and issues the following edict: From now on, hence and even forevermore, thou shalt park in only thy assigned parking spot, and no unlicensed or registered vehicles are allowed to park there. Okay, uh, so. She goes back a month after. It takes effect in a month. Then she's ready. She's got her video camera. And she's going to video the violation. And she moves down and she pans. And <sighs> Tracy's in the right spot. 
can't get her this time, or at least not today. But she just got this video cam, so she's going to play with it a while. She goes down to spot D and sees that the person in spot D doesn't have the little registration sticker, the new one, for you get annually that you put on your license plate on the car. Ah! She's going to get someone that day, so she sends a notice to the tenant in spot D. You're not following the rules. You're going to be evicted. That tenant came to see us, and we found out later she was a, a 67-year-old uh, woman that just had a hip replacement. She didn't need the car. And she'd been in um, a uh, uh, nursing facility for rehab while her hip was um, healing. So, again, she wasn't even there to get the notice, but eventually she did get the notice and came to see us. So, at that point, what's the landlord's rationale for enforcing what is essentially a rule of the road. Okay, There is none. Reasonably related to the purpose for which it's intended. The purpose for which it's intended, we know. We know the history. It was because Tracy Tennant wasn't parking in the right parking spot. So the rule was to get people to park in right parking spots, and instead it turned out to be something completely different. Reasonably related. Again, it may be different for mobile home courts, and if we get a chance, we'll talk about that. And let me give you some examples. Here. No children's toys or adult projects shall be left outside of storage areas when not in use. This comes from an apartment complex in Great Falls, uh, maybe 200 units, all of which have children. Can you imagine getting evicted from your premises because the kid left the big wheel out in front of the place? Okay. At no time and under any circumstances shall any ball, frisbee, or any other object be thrown in or around the apartment, apartment property, or parking lots. What do you suppose the purpose of that particular rule was? Windows. Windows. windows so why not just have a rule that says, don't break any windows, and if you are, you'll be held responsible. It is equally as difficult to enforce as this one. And this one sounds so draconian. Of course, people, kids, are going to throw stuff. Okay? Children must be adequately supervised by parents at all times. Child welfare laws will be enforced and violations reported as necessary. The child protective services workers I worked with for years laughed at this one. Yeah, yeah, we're coming right over, you know. <laughs> uh, can you imagine in the X's, you know, where you, the, the kids have the playgrounds in the middle of those X's uh, there, where the kids are down there playing, but the parents are on the third floor and somebody says, you're not supervising your kids, we're going to tell the welfare department. Really? Come on. Um, the use of furniture on the patio or porch or yard is prohibited unless the outdoor furniture is approved in advance by the management. And there's more rules below that for the, it has to be approved by style, color, and content. Uh, a grouping of three that don't match will be considered as three different ones. You could only have a grouping that matched. So it's uh, crazy stuff. When you are given notice to move, you shall move out as specified. If you have not moved out, criminal proceedings will be filed. Oh yeah, the county attorneys love this one too. No county attorney is going to file trespass charges in a situation like this. In the event you are evicted, you will not be allowed access to your mobile home while awaiting its removal. Now remember, this is the one where the landlord is just renting the space, but the, the mobile home is owned by the tenant, or at least, you know, mortgaged by the tenant. In this particular case that had this rule, the landlord actually got to the point where they shrink-wrapped <laughs> the whole mobile uh, 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 home with that kind of yellow crime tape, do not cross, do not cross, and so on. And the tenant had a difficult time just getting the medications and, and diapers and so on for their kids out of the trailer, and not knowing that she had the right to do so regardless. So, uh, got to have reasonable rules. Access to the premises. Uh, landlords are entitled to have access. Uh, but they have to give 24 hours notice all the time. It is insufficient for a landlord to say something like, uh, Dear tenant, this is the September month. You know we always inspect this month, so here's your 24 hours notice that sometime during the month of September we're going to come and look at your premises. No, that's not sufficient. Okay? It has to be through reasonable times of the day. The JPs always say, Well, Klaus, why didn't you just put 8 to 5 in there? It'd be a lot simpler. Well, that doesn't cover the person that comes home at 8 o'clock in the morning because they worked all night. So reasonable times of the day, reasonable people can figure that out. 
There's, of course, exceptions for emergencies. You may have some situations where the landlord just has, if they see water gushing out, out of the door, they have a right to go in. That's all there is to it. But in most circumstances, that's the only right of access a landlord has. And a tenant, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, uh, so then we have unlawful entry, clearly prohibited. Then we also have unreasonable lawful entry, okay? Um, the unreasonable lawful entry would be something like this. Again, two tenants, uh, or a landlord and a tenant. The houses are a little bit farther away. That This is on the north side of Missoula, the old railroad houses that they had out there for a long time. Uh, and they're sort of like opposites of each other. There was a stoop on this side and a window over there, and a window here and a stoop over there, so just kind of opposites of each other. The landlord, and that's all the yard, is the space in between, maybe 25 feet for the kids to play. Well, the kids didn't like playing because they thought the landlord was kind of a grumpy old guy. He used to live in House A, but moved to House B because he didn't want to live where his wife used to live when he was living with her. So just a grumpy old guy. Um, or actually a grumpy young guy, now that I say that. Uh, and he rents this place to a family, a husband, a wife, and three children. And he, re that's, and he rents it on what is called a term rental agreement. That is, the first six months of the rental agreement is a, a mini lease. Nobody gets out of this unless they breach it. And then after that, it turns into a month-to-month -month tenancy where either party can give um, a 30-day notice. Good, good idea, good practice. But he rents it furnished. And these kids have nowhere else to play, and he rents it furnished, and there's a big dining room table by the window here, and the kids run round and round and round that table. And it drives the landlord nuts. It's his rug, obviously, under that table, uh, and he just he, he just can't stand it. By the end of the of the fourth month, the beginning of the fifth month, he gives them notice that their six month term rental agreement will not be renewed. Okay, so he's going to terminate that, and they, of course they're upset. They're upset because they've had all of their utilities in their name, everything, everything you know, their schools are registered, all the things you would normally do when you move into the place. They're upset. But that wasn't good enough for the landlord because did, did the kids know about the termination? No, they kept playing round and round and round. And it still drove them nuts. So then for the last two weeks, he gave 24 hours notice every 24 hours that he was going to inspect the premises. Okay, And then he stood on his stoop and watched with binoculars in the windows. I told that landlord he needed to find a hobby, you know, do something else. It's the first time that we had to get a restraining order for a landlord using lawful entry. Yeah, 24 hours notice, but he used it in an unreasonable manner. We got a restraining order to prohibit him from doing that. Okay. And then there are, of course, consequences for a tenant of refusal to allow access. Dear tenant, uh, you remember when we first started uh, the tenancy, I told you I was looking for somebody to buy it. Ron Realtor is going to call you uh, and make some arrangements. So Ron calls and says, uh, hey, how about next Monday night? Oh, no, Monday fo uh, football, can't do that. Uh, Wednesday, then, oh, that's bowling night, can't do it then. Saturday, it's a Grizz game, not got, no, no. Uh, and it's constant excuses, one after another, and he won't allow access. In the circumstance like that, let's imagine that it gets so bad uh, that the landlord loses a sale in this market. Uh, so if he loses the sale, it is possible that one of the consequences is that the tenant would owe damages for that refusal to allow access. Another option for the landlord is actually to go to court and get a, a, what is, a, in a sense, a mandatory injunction to compel access to the premises. So, um, all right. so now let's talk about the non-compliance. What happens when something goes wrong? Uh, so a landlord, this is the non-compliance by a landlord first. Let's do this. Again, there's non-compliance by a tenant as well. What can a landlord do when a tenant isn't, uh, what, pardon me, what can a tenant do when a landlord is non-compliant? A landlord uh, can be re given notice by the tenant to terminate the rental agreement in 30 days if the breach isn't remedied in 14 days unless it's remediable in some ways. So, dear landlord, my water heater doesn't work. Uh, you have... Uh, our rental agreement is going to terminate in 30 days if you don't fix it in 14. Big deal. You're still stuck without water, at least for 14 days, if the landlord doesn't do anything under those circumstances. So, JPs ask all the time, especially new ones, why is that in there? What good does it do? Well, it's to avoid the situations like 
Summers versus Crestview, where the landlord tried to hold him responsible for the remaining 10 months of the uh, uh, lease agreement. So that's what that one is basically for. Uh, notice that the second option there is you can terminate in 14 days if the same breach occurred in the last six months. So dear landlord, you didn't fix what you're supposed to fix the last time, uh, or you did try to make a fix on the water heater. It didn't work. Here we are again. Um, so I'm giving you 14 notice days notice, and you'll notice there's no opportunity to correct the defect in that situation. Okay. Tenants have the right to use what is called repair and deduct. Um, that is, dear landlord, please fix it. If you don't fix it in a reasonable amount of time, I'll get it repaired myself and deduct it from the rent. There are some conditions there. One is the landlord has to have the opportunity to repair, has to have notice and the opportunity to repair, and then uh, it has to actually be deducted from the rent payment. Okay, so I can't just spend it on something else. Dear landlord, if you don't fix the water heater within a reasonable time, so let's take a gauge of that. All of you are renters, okay? If your water heater goes out, what is a reasonable amount of time that you would go without water? Hot water, pardon me. A couple days. Yeah, like two days maybe. Okay. Maybe take a shower. Okay. When I ask the JPs, in the state, when I do their training, 126 if we count the municipal judges, none of them will give longer than 24 hours unless it's some kind of an emergency like Labor Day weekend or something like that. That would be an exception. But all other circumstances, they're saying no matter where you live in the state, you can get some an essential service like that repaired in 24 hours, and they expect landlords to do that. Okay, So uh, there we've set the standard, essentially, as to what JPs will bear. So there are other situations where the, a landlord may simply decide that they will f fail to supply reasonable services, uh, essential services. We have those all the time. And uh, the classic example is the landlord goes to, court, uh, to the justice court to say, I want to get these tenants out. Uh, can I get an order from the court today? No, you can't. What do you mean I can't? Well, you've got to use due process, you know. You've got to serve somebody. Even Bob Dylan knew that. You know, so you got to serve the person uh, with a complaint, and the complaint has to be specific, and it has to be, you know, well, how long is that going to take? Well, you know, how long will it take you to write one? I'll, I'll do it now. Fill in the blank, you know, that kind of thing. And then what? I've got to have them served. Okay. How long will that take? And, the, you know, as the clerk is explaining the process, the landlord says, essentially, that sounds like it's going to take a while. Yes, it will. You've got to follow due process. And the uh, landlord leaves saying, I'll just go turn off their water. Okay? That's when you get to that essential services situation. And you have to kind of in your own mind decide what is an essential service. You know, if I've moved into a place and I've always had a, a, a washing machine, or let's make it different, a um, dishwasher, and it goes bad, and the landlord says, well, just not going to repair it. You'll have to wash it by hand. Is that an essential service? I'll let you think about that. So what can a tenant do when something like the water heater goes out? They can procure their own services and then deduct the cost. Well, not much you can do about a hot water heater. Boil your water, you know, uh, something else, you know. But the either, either easier example is probably a, a furnace. The gas furnace goes out, and the tenant goes out and buys a bunch of little plug-in heaters to put around the plant. I can deduct that extra cost from my rent. Okay, I can recover damages if I lost stuff as a result of that. You know, maybe flooding or uh, something like that. Or I can procure substitute housing. Some of my tenants tell me, uh, ask me things like, uh, "Oh, you mean I can go live in the Holiday Inn?" Well, yes, you can, but you're going to have to pay the Holiday Inn. And then you aren't required to pay your rent, but you're not going to get a Holiday Inn for a month for the same amount. So that becomes your measure of damages, and you'll probably end up having to sue the tenant. But notice, most importantly, that the tenant must give notice, and the landlord has to have a reasonable opportunity to correct the defect. That's a serious problem we have here with, with uh, property managers. There's a good example. Uh, tenant is living in East Missoula, was a law student, as I recall, uh, and um, um, one winter night, uh, uh, it's kind of 
both sleeting and hailing and rainy and it's miserable and it's windy and the Hellgate winds are coming up and she's sitting there talking with a friend and her front window, uh, as big as this screen, just literally fell out. And suddenly the water is gushing in over her stereo equipment and so on. She calls the landlord and the land, it's about 11 o'clock at night, and the landlord says, do you know what time it is? Yeah, it's 11 o'clock, but you know what to They just hung up. She tries again, click. You know the rules, says the tenant, the landlord, the next day. You can only call between these hours. Okay. And you'll be charged. He actually got charged $100 for that post-10 p.m. or 11 p.m. call. So, uh, out-of-state landlords are another issue that we have. How do you give notice in an emergency situation? Landlords need to anticipate that. That's obviously the landlord end up having to pay for that person's damages for the stuff that was flooded. But again, you know, that's just simply not a reasonable way uh, to get notice. All right. Now, we've talked about what a tenant can do if the landlord doesn't comply. What can the landlord do if the tenant doesn't comply? Notice the differences. 14 days written notice for the breach plus the opportunity to remedy. Notice there's no 30 and then 14. It's 14 days notice. So, Dear tenant, you've had far too many loud parties after 10 p.m. Uh, this is your 14 days notice to stop or we'll um, terminate the rental agreement. So what does that mean in Missoula, Montana? 14 more days of loud parties. No, no, not really, no. Uh, you got to stop, all right? That opportunity to correct the defect is there. But what happens then if it occurs again? Uh, if the landlord has properly documented that, five days notice and no opportunity correct the defect if it occurred in the last six months. There are very few opportunities to shorten a termination notice in the MRLTA. One of those, or there are three specifically, is the failure to pay rent. Dear tenant, you have three days to pay up or the rental agreement will terminate. Usually it's a called a, for landlords, it's a pay up or get out kind of notice is what they say. And that's not really accurate. It's not pay up or get out. Some tenants say, well, if I get out, I don't have to pay. No, <laughs> that's not it at all. You have that to correct the defect, you know, so you have that opportunity. That one's pretty clear, pretty reasonable um, under most circumstances. Then there's the unauthorized pet. That implies, of course, that there's a no pet rule. So the landlord walks by one day and sees Snuffy sitting on the window ledge inside the apartment and says, Dear tenant, I see you have an unauthorized pet. You have three days to get rid of Snuffy or the rental agreement will terminate. If they get rid of Snuffy, the rental agreement does not terminate. They correct the defect. But otherwise, and some landlords have gotten both a, to the point of a, in a rental agreement as opposed to a lease, that they give a three day and a 30 day at the same time. You have uh, breached the rental agreement, here's your three-day notice, get rid of Snuffy. If you don't, our rental agreement will terminate regardless, even if you do, in 30 days. Don't need a reason for that one. And then they have the unauthorized person. I'm surprised, I don't remember when the unauthorized person part was um, added to the code anymore, but uh, it, it was added later, okay? So what is an unauthorized person? Uh, I had a case out of Glendive uh, or Glasgow, where the old Air Force base used to be, where a landlord uh, was running a mobile home court and they owned the mobile home. Remember, they owned the mobile home and they were just renting the pad. And they came, uh, their son came home from, at that time, Afghanistan and had some serious, you know, post-traumatic stress issues when he came back uh, and was not able to find a job uh, around the area. So the parents, doing what any parent would do for their 22-year-old sort of problem son at this point, they let him live there. The landlord terminated the rental area, or tried to, for having an unauthorized person in their own home. Okay? Does that mean I can't have my mother-in-law come and stay with me for a while? Uh, if they put a two-week limit on it, am I going to lose the right to stay in my home? might be different for an apartment, but I really have some problems with that. And I've only seen maybe 10% of the rental agreements around here uh, specify who the authorized persons are, obviously the people of the family, but who beyond that? And what? where does it cross the line between a guest and an unauthorized person? Don't know. We don't have any case law. 
Three days for destroying, damaging, impairing, or removing part of the premises. Notice this one has no opportunity to correct the defect. And that's sort of like the case that you and I were talking about, Richard. Uh, uh, you know, so destroying dam if I destroy it, you can imagine if we had it the other way. Dear tenant, you've been destroying my place. Please stop within three days or our rental agreement will terminate. Doesn't make sense. No, you gotta, you got to get out. You, you're, you will be out no matter what you do. Okay? And it's not just merely uh, doing it on purpose. It could even be negligent. There's no culpability. There's no mens rea in there, okay? So, um, Tina Tennant is in her very first apartment. She just turned 18. She has Bobby Boyfriend over to celebrate her new independence, and they decide uh, they're going to have a barbecue. Uh, she doesn't own a barbecue. Uh, crafty Bobby says, no problem. I'll make us a, uh, a, something to use. He grabs a shelf out of one of the kitchen um, shelves, wraps it in 16 layers of aluminum foil, lines up nine charcoal briquettes, puts a little lighter fluid on there, takes the grate uh, out of the stove, puts it on top, instant hibachi. And they have their little hamburgers, <laughs> and it's really kind of cute, you know? So, and easy cleanup, just like they show on TV. Just wraps all the foil up in the, all of the uh, charcoal and the drippings, they're all gone, except the board's a little charred. No problem, says Bobby. We'll just take that, put it down here, take the one from down here and put it up there. Not a problem. Can't even see it, okay? Would have gone for months this way, but for the fact that after 90 days, Linda Landlord always inspected her place. So she decides to go in and she's impressed how Tina, for a first-time tenant, has really taken care of the place. She comments on, oh, it's so nice. And as she's going in the kitchen, uh, she trips a little and drops her pen. And as she bends down to pick up her pen, she sees the underside of that board and says, Tina, you're out of here. Well, I can fix it. Too late. It's only a dollar and a half. I can fix it. No, too late. She has destroyed the premises, and you can't do that. Okay, another example. My uh, former dentist, he's retired now for several years. Well, when he retired, he bought some uh, duplexes, fourplexes actually, and one of them was sort of like uh, in an L shape, uh, and there was two two-bedroom apartments and two two-bedroom apartments like this, and they were all identical, uh, so he had no problem uh, taking care of them in that way. He decided to do a six-month inspection, and he goes in and he, he uh, is, again, uh, amazed at the care these people have taken of apartment A, but he just looks around and he says, something's not the same here. Uh, it just doesn't feel right. So he decides to come back again another day to inspect the water heater. And when he comes back, then he gets it. They have built they have a new wall in the living room. They've taken the dining room, living room, and made a brand, such a nice wall, they didn't even know it was there. You know, it was just beautifully done, obviously a professional job, and they've turned that two-bedroom apartment into a three-bedroom apartment without his consent. That's destroying, damaging, or defacing. You, know? uh, you can't do that. So they have no right. That he can terminate that rental agreement. Yeah? Don't you think that part is a little bit too vague? Probably. Uh, so... He could have, what other options could he have taken? He could have said, hmm, I rented this as a two bedroom. Now you got a three bedroom. I'm going to raise your rent for the extra bedroom by a proportionate amount. If you were paying $600 uh, now, that's another third. I'm going to add a third to that. Now you're going to pay $900 a month. Okay? Other kinds of options certainly could, yeah. But they did, in fact, do something to which they are not entitled. They can't make changes without consent of the landlord. You can't paint, for example. What if you as a tenant decide, you know, I don't really like walls, white. I'm going to make them all black. Some people like that, you know, kind of a gothic look, black and purple all over. But you can't do that without the landlord's consent, and that you can... So that would include put in like a small nail in the wall? Ah, lots of places. I will get to a case on, on nail holes, but lots of places say, yeah, no nail holes at all. Okay? Um, that, to me, sounds a little bit too unreasonable. Under no circumstances will anything be affixed to the walls. Really? Who lives like that? You know? So, there have got to be reasonable accommodations. Some landlords say no nail holes, but you can use command hooks or whatever. Something that's removable. Or, if you make a nail hole, it's going to cost you. 
depending on what it is, right? So yeah, you can, again, reasonable people work that stuff out. You're not gonna rent to a college student that's an art major and say you can't hang anything. I mean, <laughs> really, uh, what do reasonable people do? They figure out something, some way to make that happen. And now with these new command hook things, uh, my folks, when they were landlords, used to actually put a little bag of tools into the, it used to be, you know, a screwdriver, a wrench, maybe a mini hammer and something else, you know. Yes, they lost them, but you can get them at the dollar store for four bucks, you know. What's the big deal when, if, if the, uh, the uh, um, sink faucet needs an extra turn because it's starting to leak, to have the tenant do that, if they don't ruin it, uh, instead of me coming on Thanksgiving weekend, you know, that just makes good sense to, again, be reasonable about those kind of things. So I'm going to take, buy a box of command hooks and give it to my tenants. It's going to cost me $12. I'm certainly going to make more than $12 a profit from them living there. So, and I save myself a whole lot of work later on when they move out. Okay. Um, there are two kinds of, well, Yes, there are two kinds of termination in Montana, uh, residential landlord tenant, ordinary termination. I give you 30 days, that's an ordinary termination. And it's amazing to me, I just had one landlord say, I don't, we cannot calculate a prorated amount of rent. Really? If I give you notice on the 17th of the month, you can't figure out how much I know, owe you from the 17th to the 17th, you divide 30 days into the, and, I mean, really? That shouldn't be hard. Um, they are sometimes trying to revert almost back into the old way where a notice was not effective until 30 days after the date for which I gave it to you. So if I gave you a notice on the 4th of September that it wouldn't become effective until the 1st of October and then would run. That was the way it was before 1977, uh, but not anymore. 30 days is 30 days, you know, so it doesn't matter what it is. And, and uh, uh, landlords can, in fact, calculate that. Yes, you can do 28 and 31 if you want, but it doesn't really matter. 30 days is 30 days. Uh, and then there are the other kinds of termination, which are the terminations after noncompliance. And we talked about those, three days and 14 days, depending on the circumstances, okay? Those are the only ways in which a rental agreement can be terminated. You cannot walk in. You can't have the sheriff uh, come over to somebody's house and say, I gave you notice on Saturday to be out in 24 hours. I want you out now. That can't happen anymore. And it happened a lot prior to 1977. Um, so, uh, the, and if the tenant refuses to move, the only, the, again, there's no eviction in Montana. The, uh, the action for possession is the legal word of art. That's how a, 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 a judge will look at that. It goes to justice court more often than not in an action for possession. And that has an accelerated time period. Uh, it's a procedural court action. There's got to be a complaint and an answer. There's got to be an answer within 10 days. That's a kind of a weird one. You know why? Because the landlords have to, had a good lobby and they got it passed in 10 days. Every other case in Montana, it's 20 days or 21, right? Civil procedure, 21 days I get to answer a complaint, all right? But in justice court judges for landlord tenant only, it is 10 days for goodness sakes. And then they didn't even believe it that that was short enough. They compelled judges to hold a hearing within five business days after that, okay? They don't trust judges to, get it done in, in the right amount of time. So they passed that one later. Okay, Retaliatory conduct is prohibited and there are specified sections of the code that deal with retaliatory conduct. First is a complaint of a housing code violation. Can you imagine? I find that the code, my light switch doesn't work and I go to the building inspector and he comes over and the building inspector says, oh yeah, this isn't wired properly. And I tell the landlord that and the landlord says, you're out. You got me in trouble with the building code, you're out of here. Well, no, of course not. You know, you can't complain uh, of your rights under the act and then get evicted for it. Uh, it a complaint in writing of the landlord's duties to maintain the tenant tenancy, such as, again, the water heater or something like that. You called uh, ABC Plumbing to fix the, uh, the uh, drain, and now I, I'm going to kick you out for that. No, uh -uh, can't do that either. And then the last one, become a... a member of a tenants union. 
Okay, and that's uh, we have cases on that. Actually, uh, people actually tried to and, to do that, kick people out because they unionized. Okay, it's, and then there's the general argument against retaliation, and that just basically is my own actually, and all of my reading under the MRLTA and the URLTA, and there is one federal court case, and I don't remember the name, not important, uh, that comes out of, of uh, Iowa in which the federal district court dealing with a URLTA provision said, while it is true that you could be kicked out for no reason, as it is in Montana, you can never be kicked out for the wrong reason. Okay, so that's my general argument against retaliatory conduct. Uh, so, can a tenancy be terminated for a wrong reason? Well, try this one. A law student um, uh, lived in a, a place where two apartments, one on top of the other in the basement, had the washer and a dryer. She comes down the stairs one day, and there's six inches of standing water, and the landlord is bailing the place out, and he is just angry and swearing and vile epithets and everything. Uh, what's going on? Says the oh, you know what's going on. I've got flooding here. I'm dealing with the flooding. Well, yeah, but I mean, what's the cause? What's the problem? He says, well, it's that n uh, damn neighbor lady, you know, nosy neighbor. She's got that sprinkling system, and it always causes this time of the year flooding down here. Oh, you mean nosy neighbor out there? She's out there now, says the tenant. Uh, oh, she's out there now? I'm going to go give her a piece of my mind. And the tenant describes this later as the landlord going into the nosy neighbor's face and right, she's right against her nose, essentially, like a sergeant in a drill sergeant situation. And he yells at her at the top of his lungs and, you know, and with, again, vile epithets and so on. So then she, he, he comes back in with a smirk on his face and the tenant says, I don't think you should have done that. And the landlord says nothing to her at that time. But the next day in the mail, she gets a, a, a rental notice for an increase of $25 a month on her rent. Mm, okay, she's been there six months, doesn't see a real connection, so she lets it go. About three weeks later, she comes down uh, into the basement again, ready to do some laundry, and there's ABC Plumbing. Well, what are you doing? What's going on? There's all this flooding again. Again? What do you mean? And she explains that it was just last week, and uh, or three weeks ago, and, you know, the landlord said it was the neighbor lady's problem. Who told you that? The landlord, says the tenant. And the ABC Plumbing says, <laughs> he tells that to all the landlords. It's this place. I've told them a long time ago, the uh, sewer pipes need to be drained. Uh, tenant's a little upset at that, learning that information. She goes down to his place of employment where he's an insurance agent and says to him, I think you owe me an apology. He says, I think you owe me $75 a month more rent. And that's when she went to see a lawyer, came to see me, uh, and uh, uh, Greg Monroe and I, uh, Greg finally ended up helping her in the Justice Court case. Uh, and it goes to the Justice Court, and the judge is asking the tenant the story, and she explains it just like I did. And then the judge turns to the landlord and says, mm, you know, this really sounds like retaliatory conduct. And the uh, response from the landlord was, damn straight. Well, he was a little puzzled by that honesty, and decided to ask, ask for briefs. So which way do you think the land, or the JP judge ruled in that case? Tenant. Wrong. He hadn't gone to enough of my lectures yet. He got unelected at the next uh, election, incidentally. He ruled in favor of the landlord, saying it wasn't one of the three listed. There is no general argument against retaliation in Montana. He didn't hear that before, uh, even though we had it in our brief and had the same federal court case in there that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, I think any time you are being evicted for what you are doing right, for the rental being, agreement being terminated, you probably have a pretty good flow. And I, most of the JPs understand that that's suspicious as best and more likely than not is probably a violation of retaliatory conduct. So, um, say like you get a 24 hour notice, normal inspection, and like that, or like earlier that week, you like chipped, like say, the corner of your, your countertop. He comes in, landlord's like, damage, you're out, three day notice. You can do that. Um, it, it depends on security deposit, essentially. Now, if he's covered, you've got to see, is it damage? Damage is defined under the Security Deposit Act as tangible loss. Mm -hmm. Tangible loss. So yeah, it's a tangible loss. Is it? 
I mean, at home, let's say you owned your own home, you just put in this brand new countertop for your, uh, you and your partner at that point, and you do that, you, you chip it accidentally as you're finally putting it in. Are you going to go out and replace it yourself again? I screwed up. I'm going to take this countertop out and I'm going to put in a new one. If I can afford it. I'd be hard pressed to think that most home, unless it was really obvious, you know, a big crack along the, you might. Yeah, like yeah if it's just a little chip, chances are you won't. Mm -hmm. You can, I don't think, landlords have the right to hold tenants to a higher standard. What's reasonable wear and tear versus a tangible loss? Okay? All right, we'll get to that in the, in the security deposit argument, but I don't think so. I don't think that that would qualify. And remember, your standard, again, we've talked about what reasonable is. You've, the landlord has to persuade a JP that holding them uh, for that chip in that countertop is a reasonable standard because mm -hmm. the, the, the JP is going to make that judgment. I don't think you could convince them that that would be the case. So let's talk about security deposits again. We'll just... Uh, Definition, cleaning expenses, reasonable and necessary to bring the con promises to the condition at w for which it was rented. Reasonable and necessary. Uh, you can't charge for cyclical cleaning. So if a landlord tells me, well, Klaus, you don't understand. We're charging him this because I always have the place, have merry maids come and clean the place at the end. That's cyclical cleaning. Can't charge him for that. It has to be caused by the tenant and it has to be necessary. Uh, damage, tangible loss, again talking about. Security deposit. Interestingly enough, security deposit is defined in money or its equivalent. Money, its equivalent. Early on, I had one case where a tenant actually worked off a security deposit and the landlord was shocked when she got a bill at the end of the tenancy for 20 hours of cleaning at minimum wage and said, well, she never gave me any money. No, but she gave you tangible she gave you uh, its equivalent, you know, work, essentially. No waivers are allowed. If you require a security deposit, you must follow the Security Deposit Act. That's all there is to it. Uh, and it, and it can't be just, you know, um, kind of, you really did it or just suggested we could do this under the table kind of thing. That's, again, it's not allowed. Uh, what can be authorized as a deduction from the security deposit? An amount equal to the damage caused by the tenant, that's obvious. Any unpaid rent, if there's any owing. No cyclical cleaning charges are allowed. And none of that can be deducted until the tenant has a notice of what needs to be cleaned. 24 hours notice is what's required. Uh, and the opportunity to do that, other, uh, obviously. No other deductions. And if you call it... Uh, a non-refundable cleaning fee or something like that. It's If it looks like a deposit and it's intended to secure the condition of the premises to the time at which it was rented, it's not going to be, it's still going to be recoverable. Yeah, Emily. Um, so the damage caused by a tenant who, um, like I was just thinking, so you break something in your um, apartment and you're like, I could fix this or figure out how to fix this for this much. Um, but your landlord's like, I just want to hire some professional and it's going to cost 10 times more. Is that, can you argue that or is it just whatever the landlord wants to do? And also what this reasonable standard is. You know, what's the, uh, if I can fix a faucet myself for $50, but a plumber is going to cost 500 will a JP think that's okay? You know, if you're someone that's never held a wrench before and that's the testimony you're going to give, yeah, maybe so, you know. Or that he picked the plumber that for with whom he has this connection and he always overcharges. You know, if the average rate is $100 to get a, um, a leaky faucet fixed. Again, it depends on that reasonable the standard. But tenants do not have a right, because of a Supreme Court case, to fix damages. Just cleaning. Okay? We'll get in that in a minute. And what's got to be in that li a written list? you got to have a written list of what's due either rent, utilities, damages, cleaning, and it has to be delivered to a landlord or a tenant in 30 days. If you don't, you lose the right as a landlord to retain any of it, okay? Any of it is not allowed. Uh, and uh, it has to include the payment of the difference. All right, I, you, you broke a screen, that cost 60. Here's the remainder of your $300 security deposit, that kind of stuff. 
and it's got to be mailed to the last known address of the tenant. And I actually had a landlord in Billings say to me, well, what if we don't know what the last known address of the tenant is? Right? <laughs> I didn't think that required any explanation to them, but, you know, once in a while we get those questions. We also have a 10-day speedy return of the security deposit in Montana, but by golly, seems like it's ignored. There are no consequences, no adverse consequences for a landlord to ignore it, unfortunately. Okay, I'm going to skip this and I'm going to go right to the cases. All right, Bohm versus Dunphy. Uh, number one, Montana. How often do you get to cite a case from number one, Montana? This case uh, from 1861, it was still a territorial <laughs> Supreme Court at that time. You know, it's worth it to just go open the leather-bound volumes in the uh, library to read this. It smells so nice. Um, the, uh, in that case, the landlord was withholding the person's bridle and saddle for not paying their rent. Okay, today it would be their uh, LCD projection screen TV and uh, who knows what else, you know. Uh, but even in 1861, the court said, nope, can't do that. You got to use civil procedure. In other words, go to court. Welch versus Rome is kind of fun to read just because uh, Justice Freeborn, who wrote that, liked to wax eloquent, as they say. In that particular case, uh, the tenant was given notice by the landlord that said, uh, 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 here we are on the 15th of the month, your rent increases by uh, twice the amount by the first of the next month. The landlord, or the tenant said to the landlord, you can't do that, that's not 30 days. I don't care what it says, that's the way it's going to be. And the uh, uh, tenant says, well, I'm not going to pay it. And then the landlord did what any other reasonable landlord would do. He moved in with the tenant. Actually, physically. And the court's kind of vague as to how that happened, but he moves not only himself in with the, la with the tenant, but actually moves his invalid mother-in-law in with him, who uses a chamber pot. And the court is quite detailed about how the when the tenants would sit down to dinner, the landlord would put his grandmother, or his mother rather, on the chamber pot and used that while they were having dinner. And so even in 1952, that was unreasonable. And they actually got into some fisticuffs and rolled out the door uh, fighting with each other at one point. Uh, that case stands for the proposition that uh, the landlord actually argued at the Supreme Court, well, okay, maybe I didn't give him 30 days notice, but here we are at the Supreme Court. Many months later, he certainly has notice now, and the Supreme Court said essentially no. Unlike fine wine, it doesn't get better with age. A bad notice is a bad notice. You've got to start from scratch. So if I, as a landlord, say to a tenant, dear tenant, you haven't paid your rent in three days, or if you haven't, you have not paid your rent. If you don't do it in three days, our rental agreement will terminate. That's good. That's a good one. But if I say, uh, your rental agreement will terminate in three days because you didn't pay rent, just as an edict, that's a bad notice. It doesn't give me the opportunity to correct the defect. So they have to start from scratch, even with the passage of more time. Uh, we'll skip that one. Uh, Corrigan versus Janney, that's the light uh, switch case out of Drummond. Uh, right, uh, let's see. Uh, Bush versus Cameron is the garden hose case. Limberhand versus Big Ditch. If you've been in Missoula for any length of time, you know that we've got these irrigation ditches uh, in throughout the community. And every once in a while, seems like every three to five years, some little toddler gets trapped uh, in one of those and drowns. Uh, and in this case, the tenant sued not only the landlord, but the ditch company that ran the ditch right behind the uh, premises uh, when a little toddler was killed. Uh, and the court basically said it, it put in the reasonable person standard. In other words, what would a reasonable person do if you had someone moving in? What would you expect to do? Because you can't be held responsible for dangers that you don't know about from based on other cases. So what would you expect to do? Well, how about putting up a sign? May not help for a toddler. Caution, beware. Maybe a foot, skull and crossbones or something. But fencing would certainly help. If the landlord took the reasonable opportunity to protect the tenant, and that's always a question for the jury, then the landlord has no liability under Limberhand. Rookhausen versus Blaine's Mobile Home Court. This is one of those where the tenant, uh, their mobile home burned. When they moved in, the landlord had 
fire protection with one of the local co-ops. And during that period of time, you know what those are like. You gotta pay a membership fee all the time. Because if you don't, then why bother paying it at all if you only wait until a fire happens, you know? So you gotta pay that on a monthly basis. The landlord had it when the tenant started there, but then decided he wasn't going to renew it, didn't bother to tell the tenant. So the tenants sued when one home burned, burned another, and then theirs was the third one that got burned, and said, you should have provided that fire protection because you had it when you started. Supreme Court said in that case, I think it's the early 90s, no, we're not going to buy that. Unless there was an agreement to the contrary, the landlord doesn't have to tell the tenants under those circumstances. They, uh, when the fire started, the fire department called, uh, came out, they looked on their list, didn't see the uh, Blaine's on there, and they just roasted marshmallows. You know, they, they don't stop the fire at that point. <laughs> if they do, then why bother, again, paying your monthly fee? So, uh, then Adams, uh, Mathis, that's the River Road Trailer Court case we talked about. Solon versus Chilcote. That's the, um, um, the, the uh, uh, nail hole case, all right? That case actually went to the Supreme Court over four nail holes. There were 14 altogether, I think. The tenants admitted that they had done 10, $10 per nail hole, incidentally, for the, this landlord. Uh, but they argued that the other four were not their responsibility. And the landlord said, yes, they are, so we're charging you, you know, and so on and so forth. And they argued about that all the way to the Supreme Court. The tenants wanted the ruling from the court that if I, uh, that I have the opportunity to correct that defect of a damage. Unfortunately, the court said, no, you don't have the opportunity to correct damage, only cleaning, all right? So you'd think at that point the court, that the tenant would lose, but no. In addition to that, the, uh, the landlord uh, rental agreement at that point said that if you take any of the money back from me that I give you as a result of our controversy, then you waive the right to go after me for any more. Okay, so in other words, you can't just do a bird in the hand kind of thing. Supreme Court said, no, that's an illegal provision. The tenants win and the tenants get attorney's fees on top of it, yeah. Um, so if you're not allowed to make repairs, what it kind of seems like in conflict with your ability to like what repair and deduct. Like where does that like? So you can call a mechanic. Uh, yes, you call can. Call a plumber. Yes. But you can't self repair. You cannot self repair for damages. That would be different than an item that the landlord has, like a furnace that goes out. Or like say, um, say it's you mess up the toilet due to your own negligence, Okay. can I call a plumber and get it fixed? You, no. you can, but you're not going to get the landlord to pay for that one. Okay. Unless the plumbing system just went bad, you know. Uh, it's been having, the septic system's been having problems for a long time. You're just the end recipient of that problem. Landlord doesn't fix it, yeah, you can get that repaired. Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't cost more than one month's rent. That's another limitation on there. Um, Swenson versus Janky, that's a mobile home court case. The tenants had organized, um, as a tenant union, the tenant, the landlord actually kicked them out because of that. Supreme Court said no, can't kick them out, retaliatory conduct. Uh, Calder versus Anderson, imagine the uh, married student housing type of an apartment. You got two um, buildings here, two apartments, two apartments here with a central outdoor walkway. Tenant comes walking down one day, gets to the bottom, slips on the gravel that the landlord had put in there, does a loop of a whirl and a vertical climb and lands on her face, has some serious macular injuries, uh, quite harmed by this. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, landlord said, not my responsibility, that's a common area, uh, or no, it's, it's, it's a, uh, a, the la because it's outside and all of the tenants share it, I don't have to do anything with it. The land tenants are responsible. And I did the reasonable man thing. I put rocks on there to keep it from slipping. Court said no. Because it's a common area, it is in fact your responsibility. We're going to send this back to the jury just to figure out how much your responsibility is. Uh, Whalen versus Taylor is a lockout case. Uh, landlord. Um, uh, is tired of this one tenant constantly not paying his rent on time, comes over and essentially locks him out of his building. 
sees the tenant as the, he's doing so, and the tenant says, well, I've got the money on a dresser bureau inside. Can we just go inside and, and uh, you can have it? Uh, the landlord actually counts it out with him and then says, no, I'm going to kick you out. So the JP didn't believe that the landlord didn't know you could not do this when he found out not only was the guy a landlord, he was a lawyer and was a legislator at the time that the tenant, Landlord Tenant Act was passed. The Supreme Court said, uh uh, tenant got, even though he was a bad tenant, got attorney's fees for that plus a new place. Uh, let's see, one more. Eddie versus Gray, Summers versus Crestview. Uh, and then the last one I want to give you, um, and uh, um, yeah, I don't know if it's on the outline that you have, but you, we can talk about it more at the office. PPM versus uh, Galbraith, Pro Professional <coughs> Property Management. Case out of Missoula District Court, so it's not a Supreme Court case. This is the one where the tenant uh, was uh, had such things on it as uh, you know failing to mow the grass they were being kicked out for that or um, what were some of the other um, just fines for different kinds of activities um, such as other other fees in including those at, 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 by sending it to a collection agency. And, and they were just charging these administration fees for v violating the terms of the lease, an administration fee. Just because they claim that you did something, here's an extra $50. Uh, and they called it a lease violation fee that was written into the contract. And uh, Judge Halligan said, no, we're not going to buy that, uh, and uh, uh, found in favor of the tenant in that case. I see that as a trend. It, again, is a, a consumer protection. Uh, and we did it with only two minutes beyond 90. So uh, that's it. How do we do? Questions that you have? Yeah, Richard. Um, I heard with Galbraith an, an additional thing yeah, was spin. that uh, <laughs> landlords cannot just send their uh, like amount owed to collections. They, they need that's to a question that uh, Richard and I have been dealing with this on a case that he had yesterday. Oh, okay. In Summers versus Crestview, they did it automatically, and they did it within like 24 hours. Uh, there, to me, that's a Consumer uh, Protection Act violation, where someone actually sends a disputed bill to a collection agency before I even have a chance to say, wait a minute, uh, I don't owe you that. Uh, can you imagine if you went to your dentist um, and, uh, uh, you know, you, sh you, you called them 24 hours in advance and said, I can't make that, but they decided, no, you're going you're gonna to pay that bill for not showing up and send that to collection agency right away, you'd be outraged. But because it's landlord-tenant law, we seem to allow that to occur. Uh, and we may be able to test that in a case that uh, Richard is working on right now. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for listening. It takes a lot of energy, doesn't it, <laughs> for an hour and a half? <laughs>